Hi everyone, uh, very happy to be here for uh, what is uh, Memfold's first webinar dedicated to Linux. We've done a lot of webinars on embedded devices in general, uh, MCU, Android, and embedded devices in general. And this is the first time we speak about Linux specifically, and it's really exciting to see uh, so much interest. So thanks for being here. Thanks for watching this later. Uh, my name is Thomas Orlandi. I'm the Linux tech lead at Memfault. Uh, this means that I spend uh, about a half of my time building our Linux specific SDK, the tools that we give you to um, uh, install inside your, your embedded Linux systems. And then the other half of my time is spent talking to our customers who are using Linux to uh, help them uh, set up Memfault, use Memfault, and just in general, improve their products. Uh, I've been working on embedded Linux for almost uh, more than 20 years now. Uh, this is one, this picture is from one of the first embedded Linux project I installed on a fishing boat. We actually uh, went fishing to, to test it. Hopefully, uh, I mean, uh, it's kind of nice that uh, I don't have to go on a fishing trip every time to test the systems now, but uh, it's been a fun adventure and I'm sure you all have amazing adventures like that with your own products. Uh, it's really fun to build something that's not just not software, but also involves hardware. And that's really uh, what I'm passionate about. Um, before working for Memfold, uh, I've led software teams at Bebel, at Fitbit. We've shipped millions of devices, uh, all sorts of devices, all sizes, all operating system. Um, so we, we've gathered a lot of experience with embedded devices, and that's really what we're trying to do here at Memfold is take all this experience, package it, and give it to you in a way that's easy to use so you can focus on building awesome products and you don't have to worry too much about uh, the infrastructure around shipping those products. More recently, I've become kind of a rust aficionado. Uh, this has nothing to do with fishing, you know, but I'm really into crabbing now. Um, and so I won't talk too much about Rust today, but I definitely hope the topic will come again in, in future webinars and blog posts. So if that's something that you're interested in, uh, we love to push for more Rust in the embedded world. And, uh, and I hope uh, we'll get a chance to talk about that at some point. So that's my quick introduction. Uh, we'll get started. Um, our agenda for today, uh, we're going to talk about over-the-air update system for embedded Linux uh, systems. Um, we will start with a high-level overview uh, of the requirements. First, talk about what the OTS system needs to do. Then we'll draw a big picture of what our OTA process looks like and all the steps to uh, update a system in the field. And once we have a good understanding of the uh, big picture, we'll dive into the implementation and really look in details, and this is going to get fairly technical, at how you can implement this for your own devices. Uh, we'll finish with some Q&A. Some of you have already sent questions when you uh, enrolled in the webinar. Thank you very much. So I have a few slides for some of those questions. Uh, and then, you know, happy to stay a little longer if we need to today to answer uh, any question that may come up during the presentation. So let's start with the requirements. What are we uh, talking about when we discuss over the air update system and what does it have to do? So if you've been uh, uh, working with Memfold before, if you've watched our previous webinar, if you've talked to me or our sales team or our founders, if you've seen any of our presentation, you've definitely seen this diagram. Uh, it's been our experience and our lesson learned that if you want to build a successful uh, product, you need to get into this kind of iterative cycle where you're going to design, code, test, eventually ship. Uh, it will definitely not be complete. There will be missing piece and pieces, and then sometimes there will be bugs. And so you will need a way to observe your device in the field, understand what the problems are, analyze the problem, debug them so that you can actually fix them, and then go back to designing, coding, and shipping. And that's when OTA comes uh, in the picture and where OTA is really important, is you need a way to update your devices in the field. Uh, we're absolutely convinced that without OTA, it's really difficult to ship high quality products uh, with the, the kind of features that people are expecting today. Uh, and so the OTA is really a, a link in this chain that's extremely important. And if you don't have it, 
um, we, we think uh, making great product is going to be really hard. So uh, that that's really my, my one slide introduction to why is OTA important? I, I'm not sure I needed to convince anyone, but here it is. So now that we agree that OTA is important, what does it have to do? Uh, your OTA system needs to be uh, predictable. And when we say predictable, we mean that um, whether you're installing a new system with a, a fresh image or whether it's your first device that was shipped three years ago and has been updated 25 times by the user, you want to make sure that the image that's running on the device is on all of your devices is exactly the same. And that's really important because if you don't have the same image on all your devices, you won't be able to debug or understand what's happening or comparing performance between the devices. You need to make sure you're running exactly the same thing. And that's what we mean by predictability. Your OTA system also needs to be reliable, meaning it's not going to leave your device in an intermediate state. And here, when I say intermediate, the thing that we're really most worried about as uh, embedded engineers is the bricked state where the device becomes useless. It cannot be updated anymore. Um, so we want to make sure that whatever the user might be doing when we're installing the update, including you know, disconnecting the Wi-Fi or just disconnecting power, we want to make sure that the device remains in a functioning state always. And even if updates are interrupted, they should be able to be resumed or restarted later. Um, and we'll never leave the system in a, in a broken state. Uh, and finally, it needs to be secure. Um, we'll want to verify where the update is coming from. We want to make sure the device is only installing updates that we have approved. I'll say right now that security is, is a huge topic. Obviously, we got a lot of questions about that, which is great. Uh, we're only going to briefly touch on that today, um, but seeing the level of interest, this is definitely a, a great candidate for our next webinar. So uh, security, I'll take as many questions as you want, but it's something that we'll, we'll revisit in the future. So. Before we, we start, I'd love to, uh, to, know, to know the audience a little more. Um, and if you guys wouldn't mind sharing how many devices are in your fleet, we'd love to understand the, the scale at which most of you are working. So I'll just uh, uh, give you a, a few seconds to answer this first poll. Let me, let me start it right here. Um, so you should see a poll on your screen, and if you wouldn't mind answering and you know giving us an idea of the size of your fleet, that'd be really interesting. Uh, and while you guys are are answering that, uh, I'll take a a stab at, at one of the most common question I get is why are we not just using a package manager? You know, I I have Ubuntu on my desktop, I'm updating it every day, it's working great. Why do I have to use a different system for embedded uh, Linux? So when we're doing a desktop Linux, we're really updating our system package by package. You're updating the kernel, you're updating the Python, you're updating the browser. Um, and really what we're trying to optimize here is for maximum flexibility. You want to have recent version of those packages when you need them. You want to be able to choose which browser you use. So there's a lot of different configuration and package managers are an amazing solution for that. But when we're talking about embedded Linux, remember, we don't have a user sitting in front of a keyboard and the screen able to uh, launch the updates or make selection. We do all of this in the office and then ship, ship the images. And so instead of uh, optimizing for flexibility, we want to optimize for the criteria that we mentioned above, which are reproducibility, reliability. Uh, and to do that, uh, we'll typically update the entire system image. Uh, so. Um, where package managers update package by package, uh, we're, what we're going to discuss today is system where we're updating the entire um, Linux system, including applications, kernel, configuration of the applications, your own code, all of it gets updated at once. So uh, that is just a, a point that um, I think is useful because that's a question we get a lot. Okay, so I have lots of replies here. So let's look at them together. It sounds like most of you, and let me maybe share the result with everyone. No secrets here. So some of you, I mean, it's, it's really a, a split across all categories. Uh, seems like we have people working in the one to 100 devices range um, and then 
um, all the way up to over 100,000 devices. So this is great. Um, and the solution that we'll talk about today work for all fleet sizes. Uh, I think once you have more than three, it's already really hard to do this manually anyway. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll see how to solve problems that apply to everyone today. Thanks for sharing. Okay, so we've talked about package managers. We said we're going to do full system updates. So now let's look at, at a high level, how do we, what do we need to do in our OTA system to, um, uh, to do those full system updates? So the first thing we'll need to do is to have an AD partitioning schema. Um, so if, the idea here is that because we want to update the entire system, and because we want our OTA process to be extremely reliable, we want to be able to restart if we have a crash in the middle of the update, we're going to partition our storage so that we can have two complete copies of the system living in parallel uh, on the disk. And so in my example here, partition A is the one that we're running from. It's the one that's active. It might be read-only, so maybe we're not even able to write to it while it's running. Um, and we have an entire empty partition next to it, partition B, which is the same size as partition A and is ready to receive an update. And every time we have an update, we'll overwrite the other partition with the update and then reboot from that update. For this to work, we also need a place to store our um, device-specific configuration, so things like the Wi-Fi password, uh, user information, some temporary storage, all of that is typically typically needs to be persisted across reboots and across updates. And so to store that in a place where um, it won't be lost during the update, we typically will have a third partition, the data partition. Um, and the size really depends on, on your product and what your product needs to do. Um, cameras and video processing devices, you know, will have much bigger data partition. For some device, it could be just a, a few megabytes. Um, and that third partition will remain untouched during the updates. So we have an AB partition scheme. Then we'll need to talk about how we prepare the update. Uh, we'll cover that in our presentation. We'll discuss how you as a developer prepares the update package, what the update package looks like, uh, what it contains. Um, so we'll, we'll discuss all of that. And then that update needs to be uploaded to some sort of OTA backend. So I won't spend too much time on the OTA backend today, but we'll, we'll show you an example using Memfault of, of what this can look like um, and, and how you can distribute the update. Once the update is on the OTA backend, we need a way from our device to fetch the update. Um, the way we are going to do this today is using a, an updater that's running inside our system that will periodically pull the backend and say, hey, do you have an update available for me? And when the backend says, yes, I do, we download the update, we write it to the partition that's currently inactive, and then the update is installed. The next step, which we'll cover in details because it's a a really interesting piece of the system and something that's not really well understood, I think, in general, is how we reboot into the update. Um, so we have started from partition A, but we have partition B on the system. How does our Linux system decide to boot from partition A or partition B? That's something that the bootloader will do. That's not the only role of the bootloader, but when you're doing an AB partitioning scheme and you want your devices to be updated, updatable, that is an important role of the bootloader. So we'll talk about how that works. Um, we'll talk about how our system running from partition A is able to communicate with the bootloader because they're pretty independent uh, components of the architecture. And then finally, once we've rebooted into partition B, we'll need a way to report back to our control system, our OTA backend, that the update has been installed and it's complete. And so we'll We'll also discuss how we can implement that. With that, we've covered the entire OTA update cycle. Um, and so now we're gonna look into, now that we understand the big picture, we're gonna get into the details of how do we implement that. Um, and specifically, uh, our configuration today is going to involve SW update as the updater, um, U-boot as the bootloader, and Yocto as the Linux distribution. 
Um, if you're not familiar with Yocto, it's uh, a distribution builder. It's a tool that you use to build complete file system image or complete disk image that are ready to be flashed on your devices. It's definitely the most popular one today for uh, embedded Linux devices. And so we'll, we'll talk about that one. SW Update is an open source updater, um, which has a ton of features. We'll only cover some of them, maybe cover a few more in your, in your Q&A. Um, but that's the tool that we'll use to pull the backend, download the update, and install it. It also includes what we need to prepare the update package on our CI system and, um, and, and prepare the files that we're actually going to distribute. So we'll talk about that. U-Boot is the most common bootloader today in the Linux embedded world. Uh, it's super powerful. If you have not taken the time to play with it yet, I'll, I'll show you a, a, a few things that you can do with U-Boot that are, that are pretty fun. Um, and uh, it's our candidate today. And all of those components, uh, Yocto, SW Update, and U-Boot are open source. Uh, Memfault is the OTA backend that we'll use today for distributing the updates. This is really distributing the updates can be as simple as putting a file on Amazon S3 and telling SW update to pull a, a, an S3 bucket. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about why you'll probably want to have a backend system that's a little bit more complex than that. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, you, you could start with that. And really uh, an important point I wanted to make is that um, with this presentation, we're really not trying to sell anything. Memfault works with all of those components, but it can work with other components as well. Um, instead of Yocto, you could be using BuildRoot. Instead of SWUpdate, you could be using uh, RAUC or other system. Instead of Uboot, you could be using other bootloader. You know, there, there's different solutions here. Uh, and we try to be really uh, agnostic of the actual implementation. Um, this also happens to be our example configuration. So if you're starting from scratch, we do provide a complete system example that has all of those components and all of the screenshot that you'll see today when I'm showing uh, actual code are coming from our example configuration and it's on GitHub and you're more than welcome to, to use it. Um, that is our configuration for today. And with that, I will get to my second poll. And the second question is, how do you build your firmware images today? So I said Yocto is very popular. It's also pretty complex. So um, if I'm being honest, it's not necessarily the best solution for everyone. Uh, build route is uh, significantly simpler. Some people use other strategies as well, um, including making their own custom image with scripts manually. Um, these are all valid options. We'd love to understand a little more what you're doing today. So let me start my second poll here. Uh, and while you guys are answering, I'm just going to take a few seconds to go through the questions we've received already and see if I can answer them. Great. So lots of great questions. I think some of them I already have slides, so I'll, I'll wait until we get to the end to answer. But someone asked uh, if we'll get a hands-on experience as well for OTA today. Um, we Everything we're showing is today is based on our example configuration for Memfold. Uh, I'm not going to try to make this a, a live demo because this would take you know, the entire morning and not just the hour that we have. But uh, if you're interested, go to docs.memfold.com. We have a quick start guide for QMU and Raspberry Pi that will get you started um, building a complete Yocto image with OTA, uh, with uh, updates, with the bootloader. And so you can just run that and uh, do this at home. Um, this takes a couple of hours because Yocto needs to build all the packages in your Linux system, so it's a little bit hard to, to do live. Um, so that was one question, and then um, I'll get to the other questions later. There's one question about how to update the bootloader. That's always a, a really interesting problem. I'll, I'll save that for the end. 
Okay, perfect. So let me share the results. I see that most of you today are using Yocto as the uh, solution to build your Linux system. So that's uh, great matches. What we see from uh, from our customers, build root is also very popular. And then we have uh, Ubuntu, Debian, Raspbian based system. Interesting. Uh, and then custom made image, um, always something that we see a lot too. Um, and, uh, and that's another great solution. At least you have complete control here. Okay, perfect. So now let's get into the implementation. So the first thing we want to implement is uh, having the AB partitioning scheme. So with Yocto, and again, all the other solutions are going to have equivalent, um, you do this with a tool called WIC, uh, which is uh, short for Open Embedded Image Creator. And it takes this file in the kickstart format to define the partitioning scheme of the image it generates. So here we're asking WIC to generate a disk image, which has four partition, a slash boot partition. I haven't talked about that one um, before, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll get into it. We have two system partition, uh, slot A and slot B, and they're both 256 megabytes in size here. You can see that one of them is going to be mounted as slash, and the other one is not mounted. And then we have uh, a fourth partition to save user data. And here it's called the slash media partition. So this tool lets you define your partitioning scheme. And so if right now you only have one partition, you want to find your WKS file and modify it so that you have your two system partitions. And now if I run my system using uh, here uh, QMU, uh, I can run FDisk on my system, verify that I have my fourth my four partition, and uh, I can also use the mount command to verify that only one of the partition is mounted at any given time. And this is what will allow us to uh, update the other one. So now that we have the partitioning scheme, we need to prepare the update package. And so we said this typically starts on your computer, you're writing code, you're uh, compiling. Uh, typically, this will then go through Git or some other uh, source configuration management, and then it goes through a continuous integration. And so those commands would typically be run by your CI system. Uh, the first command, bit bake core image minimal, is how you would ask Yocto to build a complete system image. And then the SW update comes with a Yocto layer. Uh, so it comes with Yocto configuration. It's called meta SW update. And it includes an SW update image class. Uh, and so in our example, we've used that class to generate a recipe, uh, a target in, in Yocto Lingua that's called SW update image. And so if I call that, it's going to take the output from the previous step and generate the update package. The update package is a .sw file, as you can see here, and it contains two things, a descriptor of the update, which uh, we're going to get into uh, a lot of uh, uh, line by line, we'll go through this file, it's very important. Uh, and then it contains a full file system image. So it really contains the entire um, content bytes by bytes of a system partition. It could be partition A or partition B, that doesn't matter, they're identical. But it contains the full system image compressed using a uh, zip. With that, we need to distribute our updates. For this, I'm going to use a, a quick video to show you what this looks like in the Memfold backend. Again, there are many ways to do this. Sorry. So here I'm uh, preparing a release for version 102. I'm going to create the release. And now I need to upload a, a payload for the release. So here I'm going to say that this payload is applicable to my EVT hardware. And I'm going to drag and drop the file. And then that's my SW um, uh, file that I've prepared in the previous step. And now that it's ready, I can activate it. And this uh, activation step is really where uh, you benefit from having dedicated OTA backend like Memfault. Uh, because it will give you a lot of control on who receives what updates. So we've, you, we've seen that we specify which hardware version the package is compatible with. Uh, it's very common that in the build process, we might have three 
output uh, for a different version of the hardware that might require different drivers, for example. Um, it's also very common that your population of users will be divided into different groups and you're not going to try to ship the same thing to everyone. We strongly recommend adding an internal group of users, which will get first dibs on the, on the new software. Um, all your employees should be uh, dog footing and testing the software before you ship it to your customers. Uh, so you can have, we call those cohorts, and so you can ship the release to all of your internal users. And then once you've shipped it to all your internal user, you might have a beta group. And once you've shipped to the beta group, you might want to ship it to your uh, final customers, really uh, production. And at this point, even though you've done a lot of testing before, you might want to do what we call a stage rollout, where we'll you'll first ship to 20% of the population of users, wait a few days, look at some metrics, make sure everything is looking good, everything is working fine, and then um, click the button to do the full release to 100% of our users. So this is, these are features that you, know, you really want to look for in an OTA backend, um, because having those features mean that you'll use the same OTA system to update your devices internally in testing and then update them in production. And so that path get exercised a lot. And that's how you build confidence in your OTA system. And then you become a lot more confident shipping regularly. And shipping regularly, I think, is really a, the way to make uh, great products. Uh, so that's the OTA backend. That's how we upload the package. Now, um, here I've shown how to do this manually. Again, typically, your CI system would do all of this for you you would automatically build and upload the um, update package to the server. And then someone would come and very carefully activate the release for a specific cohort. Now that the release is on the server, we need some way to fetch it. And that's the role of the updater in my previous diagram. And here we use um, SW update. This, so we've already used it to prepare the update. Now we're using the SW update binary, the, the client inside our system to talk to the server and regularly um, ask if there's a new version available to start SW. SW update works in a lot of different modes. You can just run it directly against an update on disk and it will install it. But here we wanted to use the network mode, talk to a server. That's what's called Suricata Daemon in SW Update Linguo. So again, if you're looking at SW Update documentation, you want to look for the Suricata section. And this all starts with the minus U option. So here we've created a, a little um, systemd unit that's running SW Update in Suricata mode. Now, SW Update needs to know who it's talking to. So we need to configure um, the URL of the backend, and then we need to give it some information about our device. That's all done through the uh, SW Update configuration file that I'm showing here. And this includes the serial number of the device. This is how our backend will know which cohort the device is part of and will send the right package. It includes a gateway token, which is a, a secret that's shared between your devices and the backend to authentify the devices. And then it will include some extra information such as what's the current version running on the device, what's the hardware version, and, uh, and what's the software type. So in some situation, you might actually need to do multiple updates of multiple things on the system. I won't get into that today. So right now we have one software type, it's main, and that's what we're updating. So uh, yes, and of course, before you see that we're talking to device.memfold.com slash API. So this is just telling uh, SW update to talk to Memfold to fetch the updates. Now that we've uh, configured SW update to fetch the update, there's another interesting parameter that I want to get into here which is um, we need to tell SW update how it's supposed to install the updates. And remember, we have an AB partitioning scheme. So specifically, we need to tell SW update whether it's going to install on the A partition or on the B partition when a new update is available. And to do that, we add this argument minus E stable copy two, which sets the mode copy two to install the update. And we'll see. Um, what impact it has later on when we are installing the update. But what I want to show you is how we know which partition we're running from. Because we're 
from the perspective of our Linux program, we're always running from slash. We don't know if slash was mounted from partition A or from partition B. So in the start arguments of SW update, there's this little snippet here, which grabs the current root device using the SW update minus G command, minus J. Uh, and then if it's equal to VDA2, then we know we're running from partition A, and so we'll want to update the second one. And otherwise, we're running from VDA3, which means we need to update the, the first one. Uh, so this is a, a, a tiny bit of code, but it's it's crucial. And it's one of those little secrets um, I, I wanted to share because when we're debugging uh, OTA problems and trying to understand why things are not working exactly the way we want them, understanding how all those little steps get together is, is, is really essential. So um, really happy to share that today. Um, and then here, um, now that we've started it, we can see uh, some logs here from SW update, and we can see that every minute it's pulling the server and saying, hey, do you have anything for me? Yes, no. And so, so far we don't have any pending action on server, nothing to install. We go back to sleep and we'll come back in one minute. Um, the interval between pulling the server is something that you configure. Um, in this specific configuration, we can actually on the server, on the Memphis backend, you can control for each of your cohort how often the devices should connect and um, ask if an update is available. And so in development, we can set that to be every minute. Okay, so we have a SW update. It's running, it's pulling the server, and now we want to install the update. How do we do this? So when I click the activate release in the backend, the server is going to, the OTA backend is going to start telling eligible devices, hey, there's an update available for you. And so in the client, this is what you see. You see software update is starting. Um, we have found the SW description file. And so what's happening here is that SW update has started the download of the update package, which we, uh, looked at earlier. Um, I think I forgot to mention that this update package is actually a CPIO archive. Um, and one of the advantage of this format is that you can just read from the beginning and read the files as they appear in the archive. Um, it's true of other format, but this is one of the reason why we use CPIO here. And so it's going to start by reading the software description, and then it's going to stop here, decide what to do, and then it will continue to download the rest of the file. So we found this software description file. Now, what is in it? And so uh, here I've taken the SW update package. I've used the CPIO command to extract the files. I strongly encourage you to do that. You know, really uh, understand what you're shipping to your devices is very important. Um, and so here I can see that I have two sets of instructions that differ depending on the mode in which we're running. So we've said before we were running into copy to mode. So that's what I've highlighted here. And we're saying that where we're, when we're running in copy to mode, we want to get the extended for file system, which is just raw data compressed using Zlib. And we want to write it to slash dev slash VDA3. So pretty simple instructions. SW update can do a lot more, but this configuration is, is very common. It's also something that uh, all of this is documented and explained as best practices in the SW update documentation. Um, and so here we specify how to write the updates. And now that SW update knows what to do with the update, it's going to write it directly to the flash. Um, and to do that, it streams the update directly to disk. And streaming the update directly to disk is important here because we don't want um, SW update to download the entire file in our current system partition because we probably don't have space on our system partition to have a complete copy of the uh, system partition itself. You know, then um, so we will download and directly write to disk. It's uh, much uh, much faster this way and requires uh, less space on disk. We write the image. And when we're done, you can see that the system reboots. Um, but in between here, there are a few really important steps that don't appear on the don't appear on the log. And that really important step is how do I tell 
the bootloader that next time I want to boot from the other partition. Uh, because if we just reboot the system, we're going to reboot on the same partition forever, and we're not going to switch to the new version, right? So understanding how we tell the bootloader to reboot from the other partition is really important. So that's what we're going to talk about now, rebooting into the update. So going back to our SW update description, I've promised we're going to talk about every single line in that file. Um, I have highlighted before the uh, images section, and I omitted some other part of that file. And so there's also a, a U-boot section, um, which is used to tell SW update to do things uh, with U-boot. And so uh, SW update supports a number of bootloaders. U-boot is one of them. And here we tell SW update that after installing the update, it needs to set a bootloader environment variable called root partition, root part, and it needs to set it to the value three. And the value three uh, happens to be the number, uh, the ID of the partition on the disk, so VDA3 value three. Uh, and that is um, how we set a U-boot environment variable. You may have never heard about U-boot environment variables, so we'll, we'll get into what they are and how they work in just a second. The next thing I wanted to show is how we reboot the system. So here we provide a post update command. That post update command could be as simple as just running reboot. Or here we're actually using memfold ctl reboot minus minus reason three, which does the same thing as the reboot command, but it registers that we're rebooting for a software update. And so in the memfold backend, this will properly classify this reboot as a reboot for an OTI update. But you could just use reboot, or maybe in your specific use case, you don't want to reboot the device. Your device might be a robot in a warehouse, and the device might be moving in the warehouse while it's installing the update, and you don't want it to reboot while it's in the middle of the warehouse. So in that case, you can just start a script, write some file on disk uh, that will let your application on the device know that an update is, is ready, uh, it's installed, it's ready to reboot into. And when your device is in a good state, uh, when it's a good time for your device to do it, you can, you can reboot. Uh, and uh, SW update has a lot of little hook points like this before downloading the update, after installing the update. Um, that you can use to implement custom behavior for, for your device. <clears throat> so bootloader environment variables, what are they and how do they work? So I strongly encourage you to uh, boot a device with uBoot and use the env print command to look at all the environment variables that are available to your bootloader. Um, and here in the top right, I have an example. I've just rebooted my system. I type end print root part, and you can see that root part equals three. This is what we asked this W update to do. So that's great. How does that work? Um, in the bootloader configuration, so um, when, we, when we're when we building the bootloader as part of building our entire system, in the configuration file for the bootloader, we define where we want to store environment variable. Um, and, um, and you can also define some default values and things like that. But in our example here, we're asking the bootloader to store the environment variable in FAT, so uh, uh, in uh, MS-DOS style partition. And here, um, we tell it to write it in the first partition of the first device. So that's the 0 and the 1. Uh, on the uh, environment fat device and partition um, in that in that blue box. Um, and we want them to be stored in a file called uboot.env. So what this does is that the bootloader, when it starts, is smart enough to mount the slash boot partition, look for a file called uboot.env inside it. If it doesn't find that file, it will create it. And then read some variables from that file. And those variables are also available from your Linux system, and you do uh, access them with the fw underscore printenv or fw underscore sendenv uh, commands, uh, which are provided with the uBoot uh, tooling. And um, so inside our uh, Linux system, we can print fw printenv root part, and we'll see what's the current value of the root part variables. So what I really want to 
emphasis here is that this environment variable is a way for the bootloader to communicate with the system. And because the data is stored on the slash boot partition, we can write things that will be persisted across the updates. And so as we're booting from partition A, where we can write stuff that will still be available once we're rebooting and once we're in partition B. Uh, so those are the bootloader environment variables. And uh, the bootloader is a surprisingly capable piece of software. Um, if you, again, if you haven't played a lot with uBoot, I encourage you to use the command line to, to play with it a little bit. And so in that bootloader, we're going to implement the AB switch. We're going to implement the logic that says, if I have never booted before, I'm going to use the first partition by default. If I've already booted before and I have environment variable, then I want to read that environment variable to decide where to boot from. And so it's the line that I've highlighted here, which says, if the environment variable root part exists, then show a message saying we're going to boot from this partition. Uh, if it doesn't exist, uh, set uh, partition two, which is our A uh, partition, as the as the new values and save that. Then um, we do two more things here that are really important. The first one is that we're going to load the kernel from that partition. So you can see here that we're doing load MMC zero colon root part, and so that says. I want to mount that extended three or four file system. I want to mount that. I want to get the kernel image from that, and I want to copy it in memory so it's ready to boot. And this is very important because by putting the kernel inside our system partition, we're able to update the kernel. Uh, question that I got before this presentation is how do you update the kernel, the device tree? Well. You do it by putting the kernel and the device tree on the system partition with the rest of the system. And then every time we install a new version of the system, the kernel is part of that complete system image and, and will, be, uh, um, uh, will be updated with it. Uh, and this is not what you might have on your uh, desktop where you might be uh, your kernel may be in the slash boot partition. Uh, which is not, um, which is different from your root partition. So this is uh, typically specific to embedded devices. And it's really important to be able to update the kernel. If you, if we didn't have that, we couldn't update the kernel, at least not, not like this. And then the second thing that we do here is that we set some boot arguments. And so here specifically, we set the root equal boot arguments, which tell Linux to mount our A or B partition um, as the root file system. And this is how we ended up having uh, the correct partition loaded the first time. When, when I showed you that I had booted into QMU earlier and I ran the mount command, I saw that I had slash dev slash VDA2 mounted as the, the root partition. This is because this little script here decided that two should be the, the default uh, in the absence of another setting. And then uh, pass that argument to the kernel. So really important to, uh, to understand uh, how that works. There's a little bit more that's going on in that example here about loading the, uh, the device tree, reading the boot arguments from the device tree. There's, there's a bunch of things here. This specific example comes from the Raspberry Pi. I use this one because it shows that uh, it, Typically, you will receive some form of bootloader script and configuration from your board vendor. It will be part of the board support package. Sometimes it will include the uh, AB boot logic, and sometimes it won't. Um, but even if you don't receive the bootloader configuration with the AB booting logic, it's typically pretty easy to modify the boot script to, to add that in. Um, but uh, the bootloader will always include a little more than just the AB loading because it also needs to do a lot of other things that are typically very device specific. Uh, so that's uh, the role of our bootloader script here. And now that uh, we've installed the backend, we've rebooted into uh, the system partition B, we need a way to notify our OTA backend that the update has been installed. 
And so to do that, we will once again use a uBoot environment variable. Here we're printing the value of the uState environment variable. That's another variable that's set by SWUpdate after installing an update. And so with that variable, we're able to detect that this is a new install. We've just rebooted into the new install and we add the minus C2 argument to uh, Suricata. This will ask Suricata to notify the backend that we've installed the update and we're confirming that we're good. It will then clear the use state environment variable and our system is done installing the update. We've completed the loop. Uh, and what this looks like in the Memfold backend, if you're if you're using something like Memfold, is that all your devices are progressively installing updates. And one day you have 100% of your devices on the latest version. And somehow, I don't know, that never happens. Uh, but at least most of your devices are updating and getting to the latest version. And that, that's the end of our OTA cycle. And this is really the, the scope of what I wanted to show today uh, and share with you. So uh, I'll finish with uh, uh, one minute of self-promotion here and, and say that Memfold on Linux does more than just OTA. Uh, so Memfold is a solution that's available for MCU, for Android, um, and uh, for Linux as well. And then for all of those platform, platforms, what we offer is the OTA backend so that you can uh, distribute your updates, decide who gets the update, um, use courts, as I've discussed before, to ship your updates internally first and then roll them out to uh, to your users progressively. We also provide a metrics backend so that you can collect aggregate metrics from really large fleet of devices. We can correlate all the metrics to the firmware version because we do uh, OTA and metrics. And what this allows you to do is look at things like my average battery consumption of my device per hour or number of uh, Bluetooth disconnect per hour and look at how those metrics are evolving from one software version to another. And this is really what you'll typically be doing is that you'll find that you have a problem in the field, you'll create a metric to try to track and understand that problem, and then you'll ship new firmware version to try to improve that metric. And so Memfold is really good at helping you do that. Um, we also capture core dumps. So on Linux, we will capture core dumps from all the crashes of processes on your system. We, during the build process, will uh, save the debug symbols uh, from your CI system. And then in our backend, we will take the crash from your devices, uh, glue them with the symbols that we've saved in our, in our backend, and then we're able to show you um, a view of all of your crashes that looks very much like a, a GDB and we will automatically dedupe all the crashes. And that's also a really important feature because when you have a lot of devices in the field, you're gonna have a lot of uh, uh, crashes, typically a um, lot, lot of signals coming in from your devices. Some of them are actual issues. Some of them are really just a user error. Some of them are hardware problems. You know, Sometimes it's really hard to identify which issues are important or not. And so, Memfault is able by deduping the crashes to tell you, hey, this seg fault here happened like a thousand times this week. So this is something serious. We need to look into that. Uh, and then other things we do are reboot tracking. So um, understanding why the device rebooted and labeling each reboot with the reasons so that you can make sure that your devices are not randomly rebooting or you can be aware when there are a lot of kernel hoops that are causing your device to reboot. Uh, we do log collection, so saving logs from your device, from your system and application on the system, uploading them to the cloud if you're interested in that. We do uh, device attributes, so setting some attributes on the device. This is mostly useful for your customer support team to be able to understand um, uh, what uh, the user is doing here, where they connected to Wi-Fi or be Bluetooth or cellular when a problem happens. Um, and um, again, just trying to give you one dashboard in which you have all the information you need to debug issues. And for all of the above, we provide APIs that you can use to 
uh, read the values and build some automation on top of it. So if you're not seeing in the dashboard what you what you need, then you, you can build your own. Uh, and I should have mentioned this earlier, but this is a great time to do it, um, is you can try this at home uh, for free. And when I say this, I don't mean just Manfold. I mean the entire uh, setup that we've discussed for OTA today. You don't need to be a Manfold customer. This is all free. You can go on our doc slash Linux quick start page and um, you'll get um, instructions on how to download from our GitHub repo uh, a full Yocto configuration that includes uh, U-Boot, includes SW update, includes um, um, the bootloader SW update and Yocto. Yeah, that's it. Uh, and, and has everything pre-configured so that you can do uh, OTA. Um, and so the, we do this with a Docker container. So you download the package, you go into the Docker folder, launch the run.sh script. It will uh, drop you into a, a Docker shell where Yocto is ready to use. At this point, you can run bitbake memfault image that takes a couple of hours typically uh, that will give you a, a complete memfault image, uh, a complete Linux system image with memfault installed in it. Uh, and then if you use the Q uh, alias, that will run QMU. And so you're ready to uh, experiment with everything I've shown, including play around with the bootloader, write more complex bootloader scripts and, and all of that. Uh, and if you want to try OTA, you can use a, a memfault free trial to upload an OTA package um, and install it uh, via SW update. So I really hope uh, you'll be interested in, in testing this. My, my aim with this presentation, my goal was really to uh, show you all the little details that uh, are very easy to overlook when you're uh, looking at OTS system for embedded Linux, but are so crucial when you're trying to debug an issue. I hope uh, I've removed a little bit of the layer of mystery around OT updates for embedded Linux. Um, if you're interested, we will, of course, have the recording of this webinar available. We will post the slides in PDF format. And uh, we've also, I've also posted an article on interrupt.com last week, which goes through uh, this content in a different textual format, which might be uh, easier to follow um, if, you're, if you're playing with it live. So that's on uh, interrupt.memfold.com. Sorry, I got the link wrong here. Um, you can follow us on Twitter, and we have a public Slack channel, interrupt-slack.erocoopapp.com, where I invite you to join us to continue the discussion. Uh, there's a lot of uh, like-minded embedded engineers here. I'm on there. Um, so if you want to if you want to chat, uh, join us on the interrupt Slack. Uh, and of course, we're hiring like most people these days. Uh, so if you love this stuff and you want to join me and, and all the uh, others embedded engineers at Memfold, uh, please uh, take a look at our openings and, and let us know you're interested. Uh, and with that, uh, I know it's 956 uh, here in California. We only have a few minutes left, but I'm going to look at some of the questions and try to do my best to answer some of them now. Uh, I will probably go a little bit over time. So if you want to drop off now, I completely understand. Uh, thank you for coming. And if you can stay a little bit longer and answer questions, then that's great too. Um, so let me see.